do you think about the ones that are not officially licensed? Again, like the fan appropriations and fan art, fan stories, fan rewriting. I've, I've long been an opponent of fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, th I th and let me define fan fiction very precisely here, because sometimes I get criticized by people saying, you wrote fan fiction when you were young and now you criticize it, how dare you? I wrote what we called fan fiction in the 60s in comic fandom, but that was simply fiction written by fans right. and, and published without any money. Uh, and I certainly did a lot of that, but I never borrowed anybody else's character or world. I, I invented, I didn't, you know, I was a comic fan. I didn't write about Spider-Man or Superman or Batman. I, I created my own heroes, uh, you know, and wrote about them. The White Raider and Manta Ray and Garazan the Mechanical Warrior and all that stuff I was writing when I was 14 and 15. But they were my own characters and my own stories. What fan fiction has come to mean is writing Star Wars stories or writing Star Trek stories or, or writing, you know, slash fiction, which is, uh, you know, taking, taking characters and putting them together in, in unlikely sexual situations. Uh, uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, what I don't know doesn't hurt me, so I, if, if people want to do that, fine, but don't, don't send it to me and expect me to prove it or something. Now, fan art, that's, that's fine, that's right. a whole, whole other thing. Um, fan art is great, and people do send me links to that all the time. Uh, some of this you just have to, what you want to do for your own amusement is great, yeah. but you can't start selling it on eBay or, or merchandising it, because yeah. then it, you'll get sued, if not by me, you'll get sued by one of my multiple makers of bobblehead dolls or, or figurines <laughs> because you'll be moving into John one of the Smith, areas right. that they're paying me good money to, uh, to be into. Right. So. And Tom, did you have a quick follow-up to that about what it means for the publishing industry now that, again, texts circulate beyond the actual books that you're selling? Well, I, I basically agree with George that his ideas are his ideas. Somebody, you know, his characters are his characters. Uh, for us, it doesn't have much effect because none of it is very powerful. Some of it creates good publicity and some of it is annoying, but frankly, we don't pay a whole heck of a lot of attention to it. Uh-huh, okay. So George, for you, I'm curious about what, do you, what does that mean to you as an author creating a fictional world where that world now exists in multiple forms? Well, it's, a, it's been an interesting experience, to, to say the least. I mean, when most of my career, um, writing books like The Armageddon Rag and Fever Dream and Dying of Light before that, or all of my short stories, did, there was no secondary rights. There were no subsidiary rights. Um, occasionally, I would get a movie option, you know, most of which just paid me some money, and they held the rights for a year or two, and then you'd never see a movie or something. I did occasionally get something filmed. My novella Night Flyers was made into a, a film at one point. Uh, I had a, a story called uh, Remembering Melody that would became an episode of The Hitchhiker. So occasionally something came through, but there were no other rights beside that. But then with, with uh, when Game of Thrones started becoming popular, Song of Ice and Fire, suddenly I started getting these uh, offers that I had never had before for, from various people who wanted to do replica swords or miniature figurines or, um, you know, Comic various book. types of games, uh, role-playing games, paper and pen role-playing games and um, video games and uh, just a bewildering number of things. And uh, I remember having through a period where I said, well, I don't know if I want to take any of these things. Some of them seem kind of tawdry. I, you know, I, I'm a serious writer. We, you know, would F. Scott Fitzgerald have ever uh, <laughs> had bobblehead dolls? Uh, <laughs> and then I thought about it a little. I said, you know, from what I know of F. Scott Fitzgerald, he would have sold bobblehead dolls in a minute if they offered him any money for that. So he and uh, Zelda could have continued to party. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I signed these various contracts, and uh, um, I think they've both they've been good and bad things about it. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be just a guy who who signs a 
signs a contract, cashes the check. I wanted to make sure that if I was going to do these products, that they were good products, that they were true to the mm -hmm. material. So initially, I wrote in a lot of approvals to all of these things, that they could, they could do the game or they could do the whatever it is, but I would have to approve everything. And that sounds good in theory, but of course what it led to me spending a lot of time approving stuff, and, and not only approving, but giving notes on stuff. Uh, and I was probably a little obsessive about it at first, and it, it wound up taking a lot of my time. So I, I, I still don't want to let crappy products get out there, but I, I have pulled back a little on the approvals now that I know some of my licensees and who I can trust and who I can't trust. But the good part is that I discovered that there's an enormous synchronicity here yeah. because I, I've, my readership started to build yeah. from people coming in from other avenues saying, I'd never heard of your series, but I played the, the role-playing game. Yeah. And uh, I loved the role-playing game. I thought I'd better look up the books. Or, you know, I collected miniature figures and paint them. And I saw your figures that Dark Sword was doing, and I decided I'd better look up the books. So I was getting new readers from, from all of these things. It did cause a bit of a bump, uh, you know, with the uh, HBO deal, which came along a few years later, because, uh, you know, customarily when you sell the rights to a TV or film company, they get all the merchandising rights. So HBO was saying, well, well here's the deal, and, and we get all the merchandising rights. I said, I can't give you all the merchandising <laughs> rights. I've already sold it to these other people. And what do you mean? We, we always get all the merchandising rights. And, you know, it, it wound up for a time that it was, looked like the whole deal was going to fall apart because, you know, even if I wanted to give them the merchandising rights, I couldn't because I had pre-existing contracts. But thankfully, my lawyers and agents were finally able to, to iron that out. But it was a ludicrous, but what do you ludicrous think? negotiation, a point where it's saying, yes, well, we'll give you keychains, but we keep bobblehead dolls. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're going through all of that with the, uh, with the agent. Uh, and, and now that HBO is going, of course, uh, the, the, I still have the old contracts that are, that are grandfathered in um, that are still direct to me, but everything that's not under contract right. went to HBO. So now there's just a flood of merchandising coming out because nobody knows how to merchandise like a television network or a, or a, a film studio. So there, there are new products coming out all the time, including some I never would have thought, like oh. our own beer. I mean, it's great. We have our own beer. It's terrific. <laughs> <laughs>